further into the future with Bruce Howe. It's old folks. Hmm? Yeah. I started with uh, Peter and Walter as a student in spring of 1982. Um, I think that was because I, I took Walter's case studies class and I was the only one that expressed any interest in acoustics. Um, I, I, my first task was to uh, simulate on the prime computer uh, M sequence processing and so on. So that's how I, I learned that. And using Flicky Dormer's uh, software package, what was it called? Boom or something? Bomb, yeah. <laughs> um, and then uh, also uh, that summer, uh, a great introduction to the larger community and, and meeting many of you here. Uh, uh, there's a workshop in Woods Hole to discuss developing new acoustic sources, low frequency broadband sources. And uh, anyway, that was interesting. And of course, we all know that that's still one of the sore points in, <laughs> in our field of the lack of such uh, good devices. Um, my, my first one-to-one uh, -one interaction with, with Walter, as I remember, was uh, uh, he, he very nicely invited me out to lunch on the outside IGPP uh, on the grass there. I don't really remember what I talk, what we talked about, but I remember him eating his Vienna sausages and, and crackers. <laughs> so I'm sure that's one of the reasons for his longevity now. <laughs> um, and then my, my first uh, office mate was Mike Brown. So I owe, and, and then following him was Bruce Cornell. So I, I learned inverse theory and acoustics and, and so on from them. So I'm indebted, indebted to them. Um, and then uh, also uh, at, at, in, in that time period, I got married and, and Walter and Judy uh, were so kind to, to have a wedding reception at their home. Um, after finishing uh, my, my degree here, uh, Bob hired me at APL and I worked on moving ship tomography uh, ATOC and NPAL and so on. So for ATOC, I was on, I think, 15 cruises as, as the ATOC chief scientist representative, whatever, related to the acoustic source installations and, and the cable lane that, that went with those. Um, and uh, so that, that cable experience um, uh, led me to get involved with the what's was known as the, the Neptune project, uh, both the planning aspects and the technical development, so the, the, the power system and, and cable mooring systems. And uh, given the ATOC marine mammal experience, uh, in, in partly in hindsight, I, I realized I shifted my emphasis perhaps more towards what I call sensor network infrastructure development. Um, ultimately to uh, develop and, and, and promote uh, infrastructure that would ultimately enable ATOC in the future. Um, and so that's, that has guided me the last 15, 20 years, that, that goal. Um, so that leads me to this uh, presentation. Um, let's see. So, um, in, in 2010, uh, a fellow named John Yu published an article in Nature suggesting that commercial uh, telecommunication cables be used for uh, scientific monitoring of the, the oceans. This by no means was a new idea, but he came in from left field, knew, you know, he didn't know the history, but he published this article, and the International Telecommunications Union picked up on that and uh, thought this would be a great idea to bring a, a green activity to their organization and so on. So that's is a confluence of factors really that, that 
started this going. Um, so right now, um, I'm, I'm chairman of this joint task force, um, and uh, I'll, I'll describe this project. This is still in the concept phase, but it is something that is looking forward 10, 20, 50, 100 years into the future. So this is a kind of busy slide, but it, it is a summary slide, um, and I'll, I'll walk through it. First, uh, the basic idea is that with, with sensors on telecommunication cables spanning the, the ocean basins, we can address climate, oceans, earthquakes, and tsunamis in a global context. Um, if we're successful in doing this, this would be a first order addition to the ocean and earth observing systems um, and, and providing unique contributions that you can't get any other way to, to uh, these topics and strengthen and complement satellite in situ systems. Um, the basic idea is to ride piggyback on the primary telecom mission. So science would be secondary, uh, telecom would be the primary mission of these, these modified systems. Uh, every 50 or 100 kilometers, there's a repeater in these cables. Um, and there, the, the fiber, optical fiber signal is amplified and, and passed on. So there's, there's some very modest couple of watts electric power available. And, and some bandwidth for, for communication with possible sensors. Um, there are a million kilometers, one gigameter, of operational cable now. So there's a lot more old cable out there. And that's 10,000, 10, 20,000 repeaters out there now. So the basic idea, well, and, and they, they have a 10, 5 to 15, 10 to 20 year refresh cycle. So on that time scale, uh, new cables are being installed with, with higher bandwidths and more capability in that sense. Um, the lifetime of these cables is 25 years, the engineering lifetime, and they typically last uh, even longer. I'm using a cable now 30 years old, and it, it, you know, it's just like new. Um, the initial sensors would be, we're, we're trying to kiss, keep it simple. Um, uh, bottom pressure, temperature, and acceleration as the initial sensors. Um, and this is one suggested technical implementation. So here's the end of a repeater housing. This is kind of typical pressure case size. Um, and so in here, you'd, you'd interface with the communication system and, and the power system and bring out a, a second small cable um, to a second sensor module here. Uh, the main C cable goes straight through here, and, and the sensors are around this cable, uh, but protected so that when it goes through the cable ship, it, they're, they're safe and so on. Um, so the idea is we would, if, if we succeed in this, this would become a routine operation as new cables are installed. Um, the sensor modules would be installed with those, and slowly over this, this 10 or 20 year time, we, would, we could build up to a, a coverage, global coverage like this. Um, again, one of the requirements is these be deployed by cable ship um, and, and you know, not changing the telecom operational uh, model. And we would not require any maintenance if, if our sensors failed. And we're, we're used to that in this community. Uh, well, they just fail, and, and hopefully most every repeater would be instrumented, and therefore if one failed, then, then we have redundancy nearby. So, so we, we are addressing these societal and environmental issues, climate change, ocean temperature, a single point measurement down at the bottom. Um, and, and also the pressure measurement is, is very important here. Uh, sea level rise, pressure, and, and then disaster warning. Um, so we're, we're trying to address these, these topics and, and do this within this uh, framework for ocean observing. This is uh, a framework that came out of Ocean OBS 09 and is guiding how new systems are being introduced into the ocean observing system. And then this kind of uh, 
what we we expect to get out would would fit in with these these UN treaties and and so on the Sendai uh, framework for disasters and and sus the sustainable development goals um, and and the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, so after that article was published in 2010, there were a few workshops held, and, and in 2012, this joint task force was organized um, with, with three UN agencies, International Telecommunications Union, World Meteorological Organization, and the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO. Um, and right now we have roughly 120 members and, and or, representing 80 organizations. Um, trying to organize this is, is challenging because this is all volunteer at this moment. And, uh, you know, maybe if we're lucky, you know, 10 people are actively engaged at any one time. Um, our main, my main task is trying to find money, of course. Um, <laughs> uh, but there, there have been reports, uh, engineering, uh, legal, um, uh, a strategy and roadmap, and, and then a science report uh, produced. Uh, we're, as I said, we're in this concept phase now. We're trying to find money and, and organize a wet demonstration project in a pilot, and I'll talk more about that to eventually end up with an implementation within this framework for ocean observing. Here's one, just one slide sort of on scientific eye candy, um, sort of addressing things that I think are, are have only recently been uh, discovered affecting, in this case, sea level. The whole idea that, that uh, dirty ice melts faster than, than clean white ice. Uh, air pollution and, and other particles landing on ice uh, have a positive feedback effect, which uh, melts more and more ice and so on. Um, and then also this... Uh, uh, let's see. Okay, so so that uh, ice rivers on on glaciers have been known for a long time, and and in Antarctica, Shackleton apparently crossed one, which is still there, uh, but only recently has it become appreciated that that these encircle. Antarctica, and, and they're on Greenland, obviously, too, and, and have a bigger effect, likely, on, on how rapidly the ice is melting. Um, one can easily imagine, and, and it does happen, this fresh water cutting through the glaciers and, and accelerating the breakup and so on. Uh, this, this is sea ice, so it won't affect sea level directly, but uh, uh, summer sea ice, just I, I just calculated in 16 years, will will disappear given this slope and so on. Um, so there are big changes going on, and, and there, there are new effects we're, we're learning now that we may accelerate this. Um, so in, in trying to move this project forward, um, there were two NASA workshops held uh, at Caltech in, in Hawaii um, on, on climate and ocean circulation, and a number of you here in this room attended those. Thank you. And then uh, at the Geo Forschung Centrum in, in Potsdam last November, there was a workshop on the tsunami and earthquake aspects as well. I'm doing sabbatical in, in Potsdam right now, uh, and I came back here just for, for this. Um, and, and we recognize the need for modeling to, to uh, simulate the benefits uh, that this kind, these kind of measurements might make. Um, so I'll, I'll go through through these in, in, in one or two slide detail. Uh, first, just very schematically, what an, another view of what we're trying to do. Uh, well, there's, there are these other observing system elements uh, and space spacecraft, obviously, are, are absolutely an essential global coverage, uh, providing global coverage of the ocean. Um, altimetry and, and gravity, mainly for the physics side of things. Um, and there's Argo, there are moorings and surface drifters, and we would be putting pressure, temperature, and acceleration sensors on, this, on the seafloor. Um, pressure, I think, is the, 
from, from the ocean point of view is, is the most important. Uh, you know, water flows from high pressure to low pressure on a rotating earth that gets turned 90 degrees, but, uh, and then also, uh, I mean, most, most of the cables will be on, on the, the abyssal seafloor, but they do cross shallow bathymetry, all the ridges and so on, so one can get some depth-dependent information about the um, currents. Um, so just uh, a picture on hardware. Again, this is a picture from before. This is, uh, uh, well, this is uh, uh, solid works at the moment, but um, this is one company's view of, of what might, what what's a sensor module might look like. So, and this is based on, on existing uh, C electrode a uh, unit that's attached to a branch unit. So what they're doing is replacing this chunk of titanium here that they use for an electrode with, with a sensor module here. Um, and so pressure sensor, uh, temperature, and, and uh, accelerometers can fit in, in a two inch diameter pressure case that sits outside the, the cable. And, and this other stuff protects that during the deployment and so on. So this is one representation. Um, looking at the physics, uh, I think many of you have seen diagrams like this of, of processes versus uh, time scale from seconds to thousands of years and space from centimeters to, to uh, full ocean or full earth, earth diameter. And smart cables really cover uh, a very large uh, sort of dynamic range here, uh, going from, let's say, 50 kilometers and, and to cross basin, and then uh, from seconds or, or even higher frequency um, to, to long time scales as well. So it, it's, it's not, even in the, in the best of situations, it won't cover the entire globe, but it may cover a large fraction. Um, and again, we're, we're measuring temperature, bottom pressure, and acceleration. Uh, there are reports on the web page here. So we've started trying to uh, do some simple uh, numerical simulations, and this is just the Ford problem. Uh, Tony Song is working on this at JPL, um, constructing a mission simulator. So in the, in the NASA parlance, this is doing, well, it's, it's the Ford problem. It's, it's producing synthetic data from the simulated measurement system. Um, and these are schematic kind of representational uh, cable routes. Some represent existing cable routes, the more northerly ones, and then the, the southern ones would be hoped for in the future, let's say. But again, on the time scales of 30, 50 years, with changes in population demographics and, and where you place data centers for power and cooling, um, these, these may be possible. Uh, so. I mean, in 50 years, what, what can you predict anyway? Um, and then also in Potsdam, and one reason I'm there is, is Mike Thomas and, and Tobias Weber are doing a, a observing system simulation experiment with, with their modeling system, Earth system uh, models. Um, and, and this is in progress. I don't have results yet to show, but uh, they're, they're almost ready to submit the first paper for, for review and publication. In, in the next step, they'll take some of the output from the JPL model and run that into a, a fraternal twin experiment. And then ultimately, they want to do a coupled atmosphere-ocean simulation because of the uh, atmosphere-ocean interaction at, at the uh, time scale of atmospheric storms and so on is important. Um, from the seismic point of view, um, uh, uh, well, Charlotte Rowe uh, at Los Alamos National Lab uh, provided this slide, um, and the, their, this paper is in, in uh, under review right now. Um, so they'll, uh, if 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 one had these these cables shown schematically here in the Pacific and, and this tiny little map here. Um, What's shown here is uh, if you have two earthquakes, uh, Kamchatka and Alaska, 
these are the ray paths one would get to existing uh, monitoring stations. And this is what you get with, with uh, these, uh, what would be called strong motion accelerometers um, on the cables. And so you get much more dense ray coverage. And this is a, showing that uh, in, a, in a vertical cut through the earth. So white areas unsampled, and then with cables, it, it fills in and is sampled. So they haven't gotten to the inverse problem yet, but that hopefully will come. So then uh, in terms for, for tsunamis, um, this map uh, shows the dark buoy locations, the red dots. So they're roughly 60 around the world, 50 are maintained by NOAA. Um, and then the yellow lines are just very schematic uh, cable paths. Um, and so this, the dark buoys sort of follow where the, the Pacific Rim of Fire and, and other locations like the Caribbean. Um, so that's ideally where, where one would first perhaps instrument cables. Uh, likely, it'll be the tsunami aspect of this, which sells sort of the idea at the beginning. Um, so here, here's a simulation Tony, Tony did, uh, the earthquake off Japan. And, and this shows different sensors, you know, the tsunami wave passing different sensors uh, um, as a function of time. So this is what would be available in real time uh, for uh, tsunami uh, risk um, or warnings and so on. Um, then furthermore, uh, Stu Weinstein and, and Nathan Becker at the Pacific Tsunami Warning Center have, have done some calculations also. So they've taken these uh, sort of existing routes here and then hypothetical routes here. Um, and these are 500 kilometer spacing. Uh, and what they've done is along the Pacific Rim of Fire where there's historically lots of earthquakes, they, at each location, they, they set off an earthquake and then a tsunami and, and then they see how long it takes for that signal, for that wave to reach three sensors. And, and that's what's shown here. So where you have dark buoys really close to the earthquakes, you get short uh, times and, and where, where they're far away, you get longer times. And in this case, averaging all of this, they get a 25% improvement. In other words, 25% reduction in this, this time it takes before they can issue a, a reliable warning. And that's considered very significant in the tsunami world. Um, let's see. Okay, so um, we're, we're making some progress here. Um, last December, uh, RFP was issued in New Caledonia by the Office of Post and Telegraph Telecommunications uh, there. Uh, and that included an option for this smart capability. Um, and so they're awaiting the bids uh, and, and we'll, we'll see what happens there. Um, this is an area of high earthquake and tsunami threat and interesting oceanography. This is New Caledonia. Here's Fiji, roughly 2,000 kilometers. So they're, uh, what's that, 20, well, maybe 40, uh, 40 uh, repeaters perhaps. Um, we don't have to instrument all of them, but uh, it would be nice, let's say 20. Uh, it's modest scale in terms of, of uh, it's not too long, the cable. Um, the project, uh, Office of Post and Telecommunications, they want the project because they do see the societal benefit. Um, it's between friendly countries, so presumably permitting and legal issues are minimized. Um, the, the, this is a uh, public-private company, so it's, it's uh, owned predominantly by the French government. Uh, which is good, and, and so the commercial aspects are, are reduced in, in this project. Um, it's plausible that in the time frame of, of this project, we can actually raise enough money, we're guessing somewhere between four and, and $10 million um, to pay the incremental capital cost, and that's the agreement with, with OPT. Um, there would be no, they would not charge us any any continuing costs, so it's that one-time capital cost. Um, in this area, there are three dart buoys sort of off, off this map, a thousand kilometers away, one, two, and three, and uh, 
these are some of the most expensive ones to maintain because they're far from any other uh, port. Um, and then, so finally, uh, if, if we can pull this off, this would be the, the perfect pilot system because it would demonstrate the entire capability, uh, full integration into repeaters and uh, provision, presumably, of, of high quality scientific data. Um, second development, uh, last April, uh, there was a law uh, passed and signed, or bill passed and signed into law by President Trump. In April, this, this was tied to a National Weather Service bill, but one part of it is, is a Tsunami Warning Education Research Act, and it calls upon NOAA to develop practical applications, including integration of tsunami sensors into federal and commercial submarine telecommunication cables. So that officially authorizes NOAA to begin to investigate, and, and it doesn't authorize new money, but it, it um, lets them spend some of their current money, if they so choose, on this. And in fact, the tsunami program manager has said that if, if the new Caledonia system moves forward, he would be willing to put in a substantial amount of money into that system, because ultimately they could maybe not have to have those dark buoys out there. Um, I should say that a lot of this planning started with John Orkut and, and uh, back in 2012 uh, with, with NOAA at PMEL um, with a system called Pacific Fiber, and I'll, I'll mention that in a minute. Uh, an important aspect of this, this law, well, two things. One is they mentioned federal cables, so the U.S federal government has cables to many of their territories outside the continental U.S., and so it may be that some of those cables, as they are replaced, may be suitable candidates for this. Um, and then it also sends a message to the rest of the federal government that uh, this is you know, something that Congress wants to see move forward. Uh, some other developments, um, there, there are other systems out there that are providing early warning capability. Uh, in Japan, there's a DUNET system, which is kind of a hybrid uh, early warning science. It has plug and play capability. Um, that started, well, planning started in, after the Kobe earthquake. Um, and then after the 2011 earthquake, uh, Japan invested a huge amount of money on the order of half a billion dollars to install the, this cable system. I think it's all installed by now, but it's, it's I think, 5,000 kilometers of cable and, and 200 sensor locations, uh, six different independent cable systems in there. So, but that's strictly early warning. There's, uh, it's in some ways similar. Uh, they put all the instruments in a repeater housing, but they don't have the telecom, the high, high bandwidth telecom aspect to it. Then I, I think most of you are aware of the, uh, the Neptune-like systems off the U.S. West Coast, both Ocean Network Canada and the OOI Regional Cable Array, as it's called now. Um, and then also last April there was a workshop on uh, improving early warning off Cascadia, perhaps with, a, with yet another cable system off the West Coast. Um, so things like that are moving forward. Um, last December, in this very room, there's a workshop on uh, uh, the Deep Ocean Observing Strategy Project. Uh, as, as many of you know, there's the Global Ocean Observing System, and that has primarily emphasized the upper ocean. So Argo floats go down to one or 2,000 meters, and, and there's satellites at the surface, other surface things, but there's very little down deeper. And uh, so this is a project started by Goose to um, uh, try and determine how best to move forward to, to sample the deep ocean. Um, and so I'm, I'm involved in that, and I, I see the smart cables as, as playing a role in, in that strategy. Um, also, uh, an, another sort of motivating factor uh, is, is that um, there are these, these areas in gray here that are uh, in international water, 
and they're administered by the International Seabed Authority, um, and it's the single UN agency that actually tries to make money uh, by issuing leases to companies for ocean mining, typically for ocean mining. And so the, the, um, the deep sea biology community is, is very, very concerned about the possibility of that happening. And, and there was an article in Science last, last February, um, this map comes from this picture, um, showing those areas and, and calling for a deep ocean observing system uh, from their perspective, the biology side, but they call for a two to three billion dollar investment and, and a 10 percent per year after that uh, to adequately observe the deep ocean. Um, another activity going on um, that may include cable systems is the integrated Arctic observing system and, and Hana here is involved in that, um, trying to organize, uh, well, an Arctic observing system, and, and it's, for a long time, cables have been talked about as a possible player in that. So coming close to the end here uh, before lunch, uh, we, there are obviously challenges in, in making this move forward. Uh, there's some technology issues, uh, security of the network, concerned about intrusions of, of people getting into the telecom system. Um, in some cases, there, there could be legal and permitting issues, and, and business models um, need to be developed for different funding scenarios. Depending where the money comes from, the business model will be different. Um, with perhaps somewhat naively at the beginning, we assumed that companies would, would be interested in this and, and want to show their social responsibility, but unfortunately, that has not proven to be the case. So we're... we're sort of falling back to, frankly, uh, looking for more conventional science funding sources for this initial wet demonstration or pilot experiment. Um, I mentioned the specific fiber uh, uh, project that took, well, was in planning stages in 2012 and 13, um, and in that uh, TE Subcom, the, the largest submarine cable company, and, and the, the, the financial people involved in this project and, and John and others, PMEL, all concluded that, that this would be feasible to do in the time frame and in the cost framework of a commercial project. And it, it was not, it did not occur for completely unrelated financial reasons. Uh, these, these big submarine cable systems are on the order of uh, 300 million 500 million dollars in that case, and uh, it's hard to get, you know, funding for that, and so it fell through for other reasons. Um, one company that does make repeaters um, has started to uh, incorporate acceleration sensors into their repeaters uh, from their perspective as for engineering diagnostic measurements, you know, as it's put in the water and so on. But it does show that data can be returned um, at, at reasonably high frequency. Um, and, and these have impacts for the potential system between New Caledonia and Fiji. Uh, next steps, uh, as I said, we're, we're trying to make sure that this does fit within the framework for ocean observing. There's a JCOM, this is Joint, Joint Commission for Oceanography and Marine Meteorology. That's kind of at the apex of the pyramid uh, for global ocean observing. Um, they're having a meeting in, in Bali and, and we'll be presenting there looking for a recommendation that this concept be pursued. Um, and then there's a data buoy coordination panel, uh, which is a subset of JCOM, uh, that deals with fixed measurements typically. So we're participating there. We will, our group will have a workshop in, in Brest 13th of November in conjunction with this. Um, so we're continuing to push this uh, new Caledonia system. And for funding, we're, we're, we'll be setting up the structure within Europe to make sure that the next research infrastructure call for proposals includes the appropriate words that will facilitate a proposal from us. Um, in the US, uh, 
we're trying to work with NOPP, which we think is the appropriate agency for funding something like this to, to also issue an RFP where, where this would be applicable. That's still uncertain. Um, we're trying to make contact with development banks. So uh, Fiji, for instance, is a developing country and so has access to development bank money. Um, and another long-term goal is to work towards the Ocean OBS 19, 19 meeting in Honolulu uh, just about two years from now uh, where the past 10 years is reviewed and the next 10 or, or longer term is, is uh, discussed and, and uh, planned. So we, we need to have a good presence there. So in, in, in summary, um, we feel um, through, through the white papers, workshops, and, and the publications that are starting, we've demonstrated the scientific and, and uh, societal uh, needs uh, that this project can fulfill. Uh, we think those technical solutions are tractable. Um, we do need to address these network concerns. Uh, business models need to be formulated better. Um, we need to interact with, with all the stakeholders, continue that, and in the end, it's, it's the funding. So I just leave that as the closing slide. Um, I didn't use the word acoustics, I think, in this. So I leave that to your imagination of what could be done with this system. Uh, one advantage of this, this kind of technical implementation is this becomes a general purpose interface here. Here you have a wire with, let's say, Ethernet and power. So you could put any sensor on there uh, that, that fits within this module and, and so on. We, the stakeholders purposely did not include hydrophones, which probably are the longest uh, or the, the sensor with the most experience in the ocean uh, because of the political and, and, and military connections that, that might impede progress. So the, the initial sensors are listed here, but the reason I'm doing this is because I see in phase two, we will put hydrophones in and, and perhaps more. Thank you. We'll go one question for Bruce. We'll just we'll let Walter have the... Oh, when we use ET pressure gauges to measure tides, our principal problem was instrument drift. What have you done about that? Um, right now, uh, there, there's work being done to do in situ calibration of pressure sensors. Um, the, the one that's most discussed is, is paroscientific pressure sensor. And the idea is you mechanically switch between external pressure to internal normally atmospheric pressure in the, inside the pressure case. And you do that once a month or, or whatever. Um, and you have a barometer to measure internal. This has been done in the lab for over a year now and shows peak to peak variation of one centimeter. They are, I, I believe one has been installed on the Mars system in Monterey Bay. Um, and then uh, Kongsberg, that, that's done by uh, APLUW with, with uh, who else? Uh, well, the, the, the regional cable array people, Will Wilcock, and then uh, Kongsberg, a company in Norway uh, that does sensor integration is, is also working on that as well. So there's hope for that. Um, but for tsunami detection, you don't need that. So, you know, there's a, there's a balance, but yeah. No, I understand, absolutely, and, and, but then again, think of the time scales. You know, even the, in the, the best scenario, you know, we're, we're three years away of putting something in the water, uh, realistically five years, and, and then, you know, in that time, one would hope we can solve the drift problem. Now, I know it's been 50 years where it has not been solved, but uh, there's hope. Right. Thank Bruce again and thank all the speakers. Thank you very much.